from the comfort of their plush offices and five to six figure salaries, self-appointed activists, non-government organizations, social movements, they often denounce child labor as their employees rush from one five-star hotel to another. So these people, they use $5,000 laptops, um, SUV vehicles, they pay 500 to 1,000 euros a night in hotels, junkets, and they pontificate sanctimoniously about child labor as a moral abhorrence. The hair-splitting distinction made by the International Labor Organization, the ILO. So the hair-splitting distinction between child work and child labor conveniently targets impoverished countries while letting its budget contributors, the developed countries, industrial countries, off the hook. So as a child, you can safely work in Canada or the United States because they contribute to the budget of the ILO. But woe and be and woe be unto you if you dare to do the same in I don't know Uganda or Namibia or somewhere in Asia. Reports regarding child labor surface periodically. We see the harrowing images of children crawling in mines, faces ashen, body deformed, the agile fingers of famished infants weaving soccer balls for their more privileged counterparts in the United States of America, tiny figures huddled in sweatshops, toiling in unspeakable conditions. It is heartrending, and it gives rise to a veritable not-so-cottage industry of activists, commentators, legal eagles, scholars, and opportunistically sympathetic politicians. Ask the denizens of Thailand, Sub-Saharan Africa, Brazil, Morocco, Nigeria and Sierra Leone, where I've worked for four years. Ask these people, and they will tell you how they regard these altruistic Western uh, fat cat hyperactivity. They regard it with suspicion and resentment, even hatred. Underneath the compelling arguments of the West lurks an agenda of trade protectionism. At least, this is what they wholeheartedly believe. Stringent and expensive labor and environmental provisions in international treaties may well be employed to fend off imports based on cheap labor and the competition that they, they wreak on, all, on well ensconced domestic industries and their political stooges. The textile industry in the United States is a major example. And so this is especially galling since the sanctimonious West has amassed its wealth on the broken backs of slaves and children. The 1900 census in the USA found that 18%, 1-8% of all children, almost 2 million in all, were gainfully employed. The Supreme Court ruled unconstitutional laws banning child labor. As late as 1916, the decision was overturned only in 1941. The GAO published a report in which it criticized the Labor Department in the United States for paying insufficient attention to working conditions in manufacturing and in mining in the United States, where many children are still employed. The Bureau of Labor Statistics pegs the number of working children between the ages of 15 and 17 in the United States at 4 million, 3.7 million 20 years ago. One in 16 of these children worked in factories and in construction. More than 600 teenagers died of work-related accidents in the last, uh, in, in, in every decade, die every decade in the United States. Child labor, let alone child prostitution, child soldiers, child slavery, 
These are phenomena best avoided in an ideal world, but they cannot and should not be tackled in isolation. There are root causes for child labor, which should be, should be the main focus of international aid and development. Underage lab labor should not be subjected to blanket castigation. Working in the gold mines or the fisheries of the Philippines is hardly comparable to waiting on tables in Nigeria or, for that matter, um, in the United States in a restaurant. There are gradations. There are hues of child labor. The, that children should not be exposed to hazardous conditions, long working hours, that children should not be used as means of payment, physically punished, that children should not serve as sex slaves, that's commonly agreed, that they should not help their parents plant and harvest, that may be more debatable. As Miriam Wasserman observed in Eliminating Child Labor, published in the Federal Bank of Boston's Regional Review in the second quarter of 2000, as she had observed, it depends. It depends on family income, education policy, production technologies, and cultural norms. About a quarter of children under 14 throughout the world are regular workers. This statistic masks vast disparities between regions like Africa, where about 42% of children work, and Latin America, with 17%. In many impoverished locales, Child labor is all that stands between the family unit and all pervasive life-threatening destitution and famine, hunger. Child labor saves the family. Child labor declines markedly as income per capita grows. To deprive these bread earners of the opportunity to lift themselves and their families incrementally above malnutrition, disease and famine, that's the apex of immoral hypocrisy. Quoted by The Economist, a representative of the much decried Ecuador Banana Growers Association and Ecuador's labor minister, they summed up the dilemma very neatly. Just because they are under age doesn't mean we should reject them. They have a right to survive. You can't just say they can't work. You have to provide alternatives. It reminds me of the musical Fair Lady where the father um, says, you know, I can't afford morality. Regrettably, the debate is so laden with emotions and self-serving arguments that the facts are often overlooked. The outcry against soccer balls stitched by children in Pakistan led to the relocation, relocation of workshops run by Nike and Reebok. Thousands lost their jobs, including countless women and 7,000 of their progeny. The average family income, anyhow meager, fell immediately by 20%. Economists Drusilla Brown, Ellen Deirdorif, and Robert Stern observed dryly after this debacle. While Baden Sports can quite credibly claim that their soccer balls are not sown by children, the relocation of their production facility undoubtedly did nothing for their former child workers and their families understatement of the century. Such examples abound. Manufacturers fearing legal reprisals and reputation risks, naming and shaming by overzealous activists and NGOs, manufacturers engage in preemptive sacking. They just fire children. German garment workshops fired 50,000 children in Bangladesh in 1993 alone, in anticipation of the American, never legislated, Child Labor Deterrence Act. Quoted by Wasserstein, former Secretary of Labor, Robert Reich notes, I mean, Wasserstein quotes the former Secretary of Labor, Robert Reich. Robert Reich says, stopping child labor without doing anything else could leave children worse off. If they're working out of necessity, as most of them are, stopping them could force them into prostitution or other employments with greater personal dangers. The most important thing is that they be in school and receive the, the education to help them leave poverty. So contrary to hype, three quarters of all children work in agriculture and with their families. Less than 1% work in mining and another 2% in construction. 
Most of the rest of the children work in retail outlets and services, including personal services, which is a euphemism for prostitution. UNICEF and the ILO are, have established school networks for child laborers and provided their parents with alternative employment. That's a good start. But this is a drop in a bucket of neglect, in a sea of neglect, in an ocean of neglect. Poor countries rarely prefer education on a regular basis to more than two-thirds of their eligible school-age children. This is especially true in rural areas, where child labor is a widespread blight. Education, especially for women, is considered an unaffordable luxury by, by many hard-pressed parents. In many cultures, work is still considered to be indispensable in shaping the child's morality and strength of character and in teaching the child a trade. The Economist elaborates. In Africa, children are generally treated as mini adults. From an early age, every child will have tasks to perform in the home, such as sweeping or fetching water. It is also common to see children working in shops or on the streets. Poor families will often send a, send a child to a richer relation as a housemaid or houseboy in the hope that he will get an education. A solution recently gaining steam is to provide families in poor countries with access to loans secured by the future earnings of their educated offspring. The idea was first proposed by Jean-Marie Ballant of the University of Namur and James Robinson of the University of California at Berkeley, and it's now permeated the mainstream. Even the World Bank has contributed a few studies. Um, famous studies, Child Labor, the Role of Income Variability and Access to Credit Across Countries, authored by Rajiv Dehejia of the NBER and Roberta Gatti of the Bank's Development Research Group. Abusive child labor is abhorrent. It should be banned. It should be eradicated. I'm not arguing with this. All other forms of child labor should be phased out way more gradually and incrementally and mercifully. Developing countries already produce millions of unemployable graduates a year, 100,000 in Morocco alone. Unemployment is rife and riches in certain countries, such as the Republic of Macedonia or North Macedonia, more than one quarter or one fifth of the workforce. Children at work may be harshly treated by their supervisors, but at least they are kept off the far more menacing streets. Some kids even end up with a skill and are rendered employable for life. They, we should not deny them this opportunity.